My name is Colin McDonald, and today I'll be giving you a presentation of the article Lying Words, Predicting Deception in Linguistic Styles by Matthew Newman, James Pennebaker, Diane Barry, and Jane Richards. <clears throat> so I'll be talking about lying. Lying is important just because about everyone does it just about every day, from your mother, your best friend, your worst enemy, sports stars, obviously politicians, everybody. In 1994, an average woman by the name of Susan Smith actually went on TV claiming that her two children were kidnapped at gunpoint, and she had created an elaborate story about this. It wasn't until later that FBI agents realized she had fabricated the entire thing. They only realized this when they really analyzed her linguistic tone and patterns and realized that she was saying everything in the past tense that my children needed me and wanted me, as opposed to what family members of kidnapped victims normally say, which is that they need me, they want me, they assume they're still alive, this woman kind of gave it away. So as you can see, some liars have control over the content, but very rarely do they have control over their approach to lying and their style of lying. <clears throat> so because it's so important, there is a growing body of research investigating the linguistic styles of communication as related to lying. This article will focus on pronoun use, the emotionally toned words, prepositions, and conjunctions. However, most previous research has focused on content words. That is, verbs, nouns, uh, adver most adverbs, a lot of adjectives, such as studies by Feldman Barrett, Williams and Fall in 1995, and Frank and Ekman, 1997, which identified the rate at which content words we're predicting deception accurately. While similar studies to this have been successful, such as Breach, Edward, Roberts, and Bold, 2000, and Friedman and Tucker, 1990, they all isolate one linguistic dimension at a time, in their cases specifically, self-references and negative words, respectively, with those studies. They investigated the relationship of these dimensions to the probability of deception. This leaves out an important thing, however. So, this study tests several dimensions at once, allowing for a multivariate profile of deception to be constructed. The authors, Newman, Pennebaker, Barry, and Richards, hypothesized that when lying, subjects will use fewer self-references, fewer cognitive complexity words, and more negative words, negative emotion words, even. This is because First-person singular pronouns often indicate a sense of subtle proclamation towards ownership. They seem to proclaim that that person owns the word. Liars avoid this, therefore, to disassociate themselves with their deception. Furthermore, deception and deceptive language should consume more cognitive capacity as it requires the user to make something up completely. This leads liars to tell their stories in less complex manners. And finally, liars often feel guilty and even uncomfortable about their deception. Therefore, this causes them to use the communication in a manner characterized by words reflecting negative emotion, such as hate and worthless and sad. The authors further hypothesized that linguistic profiles based on one sample could be generalized to an individual sample that they could do later. Finally, they hypothesized that profiles created from their self-designed computer program of analysis would be more accurate at de detecting deception in human lies than their human counterparts would, could judge. To test these hypotheses, the authors created five studies from two different universities. In the first four studies, there was the, a female experimenter individually associated lies with one-on-one uh, subjects. Excuse me. Those subjects and responses were then analyzed by human judges as well as their self-designed computer analysis program. This was called the Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count Program, or abbreviated to LIWC, as I'll say in the rest of the pr uh, presentation. The authors then identified and analyzed five categories of words that often predict deception. These categories are first-person singular pronouns, 
Third person pronouns, negative emotion words, exclusive words, and motion verbs. Study one involved 101 SMU undergraduates videotaping both the truth and lie regarding their personal opinion about abortion, pro-life, or pro-choice. <clears throat> Each subject was given two minutes for the truth and two minutes for the lie to make it as convincing as possible in this videotape of them talking about their attitude as they were told that their peers and fellow participants would be judging them and trying to guess if their responses were true or false. These responses were then counterbalanced. In study two, 44 SMU undergrads in this kind typed their responses, one truth and one lie, in about five minutes for each essay, regarding abortion. They were again encouraged to make it as uh, realistic and convincing as possible, as their fellow peers and participants would judge them and try to guess. And once more, results were counterbalanced. Study three involved 55 SMU undergrads who were this time told that they were just part of a generic pro uh, project on interpersonal communication. In this study, a female experimenter approached each subject individually and handed them a packet of materials, asking them to hand write an essay, again in about five minutes, de depicting their views on abortion, pro-life or pro-choice. Once more, told to make it as convincing as possible, and responses were counterbalanced. Study four was a little different in that it required that 27 SMU undergrads to videotape four responses, two true and two false, about three minutes each, regarding their perception and attitude of friends, their colleagues, their work, fellow workers, their fellow students, family. They wanted to hear what they thought about these people. They were encouraged to tell both real stories and invalid false ones to make it as convincing as possible. And in this study, all combination of responses were included to increase the scope of responses included so that the authors could get the best idea of all lies represented. Study five, however, was when the real change up came. In this study, it was a little different as it involved 60 Texas undergrads all in the same room. When they were gathered in this room, half were instructed to sit in place and look around and that was it while half were instructed to look, find a book, open it up, and steal the dollar bill that was inside. An experimenter, after this was done, then brought them in one by one into an interrogation and accused them, accused them all of theft. Now, they had been told to deny the claim of theft, and if they did so successfully, and if they convinced their, the interrogator of their freedom, then they would get the dollar bill, the motivation. The experimenter asked them four questions. What they did exactly when they entered the room, what the room looked like, what the context of the room was, to describe if they had actually taken the money or not, and lastly, again, to say exactly what they had done from the minute they got into the room to the minute they left. The experimenter ultimately pretended to believe all of the subjects, so they all were, more, were rewarded with the dollar bill. These studies showed that human judges, first off, just performed poorly. They performed worse than chance in each study individually, and overall, weren't even close. However, the LIWC performed better than chance in studies one, two, and three, but not four or five. Because the authors wanted a more general picture of linguistic markers, they entered five prediction, predictors into a logistic regression predicting deception. When they took these categories into consideration, deceptive communications were categorized by, for, by fewer first-person singular pronouns, fewer third-person pronouns, more negative emotion words, fewer exclusive words, and more motion verbs. As you can see from the table below, the authors correctly predicted that all except third-person pronouns reliably characterized deception. When all these five studies were combined, the LIWC correctly identified 59% of liars and 62% of, of uh, truth tellers for an overall accuracy of 61%, much better than chance. They then calculated Cronbach's alpha to examine the overall reliability, which was 0.93, suggesting that many of these linguistic markers of deception were consistent across various situations. 
Although it is evident that the studies about abortion were more effective than the one about friends and the one about mock crime. As you can see in this table here, all three of the studies on abortion, one, two, and three, were all highly significant in their accuracy predicting truth and false. Especially in study three, in which it predicted an overall accuracy of 67%, which is highly significant. And although study four and five did not produce significantly accurate results, the overall ability of the LIWC to determine truth versus lies, again, came at 61%, which is highly significant. So, although four of the five predictive categories were successfully resulted in the way that the authors predicted, they kind of realized that context is an extraordinarily important factor in the real world that they didn't really take into consideration here. It's one of the major limitations of the study, frankly. Um, motivation to lie and emotional involvement in a lie are both extremely influential con uh, factors. Excuse me, the comment to the right which demonstrates nicely. It depicts a man taking oath, which implies something personal or important, and crossing fingers. This would be a real world example of a lie in which it's different from saying you stole a dollar bill in a psychology study that you know of. Furthermore, the other main limitation of the study is that it deals exclusively with English and probably American English at that. Besides the obvious difference in vocabulary, uh, other languages have different patterns of language use altogether. For example, many Romance languages don't even require the use of singular first person pronouns. In Spanish, you don't say yo soy Bob to say I am Bob, you just say soy Bob, you drop the yo altogether. This is the same in Latin, although the chances that someone's going to lie to you in Latin are rapidly declining nowadays. However, this all demonstrates the need for more research, similar to this study, on linguistic markers of deception in other languages. In conclusion, the computer-based analysis was highly effective at predicting deception across several linguistic dimensions, variables, and studies. This also shows the need for more studies with and without LIWC involving the role of non-content words as opposed to previous research focusing on the content words and their role in predicting deception. Overall, liars tell, just tend to tell stories that are less complex, less self-relevant, and more negative. So, with all this in mind, go out. Challenge your friends on their lies. Challenge yourself. And remember, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Thank you.